Welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast, helping you propel your writing business to a whole new level. And now, here's your host, Ed Gandia. Hey there, welcome to the High Income Business Writing Podcast. I am your host, Ed Gandia, and this is the podcast for business writers and copywriters who want to earn more and less time doing work they love for better clients. Just a quick reminder that you can find detailed show notes for this episode at b2blauncher.com forward slash episode 160. And those notes are going to include a summary of our discussion as well as links to any resources we mentioned during the show. I am super excited about this episode because we're covering a topic that's extremely relevant and practical for a big part of my audience. And that is how to turn more prospects into clients when you're an introvert. Or to put it more simply, how to sell more effectively. Because truly, guys, sales is all about turning prospects into clients. Marketing is about generating leads, about getting interest, generating interest, and getting people to contact you. But selling is all about turning those leads or prospects into clients. And here's one of the biggest misconceptions in business. Extroverts are better at selling than introverts. The common wisdom, and this has been perpetuated for decades, is that to be good at sales, you have to be uh, quick on your feet. You have to have the gift of gab. You have to be a smooth talker and charming. And the fact is, nothing could be further from the truth. And as my guest explains, as an introvert, you have a big edge over your extroverted peers. Not only that, but equipped with a sales process, you can become a master at closing business, at turning more prospects into clients. And it has nothing to do with your personality. Instead, it has all to do about shifting your mindset and arming yourself with a process that works. My guest is Matthew Pollard. Matthew is an internationally award-winning blogger and contributor to CEO, entrepreneur, and top sales world magazine. He is a recurring guest on Fox and NBC, and he has appeared on top-rated podcasts, including Entrepreneur on Fire and Eventual Millionaire. He's the author of the best-selling book, The Introvert's Edge, How the Quiet and Shy Can Outsell Anyone, and he has five multi-million dollar business success stories to his name, all before the age of 30. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview, and you know what? Even if you're not introverted, even if you consider yourself an ambivert, somewhere in the middle like I am, or an extrovert, you're going to get a ton out of this discussion. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Matthew Pollard. Matthew, great to have you on the show, my friend. Mate, I'm ecstatic to be here. Thank you for having me on. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to jump right in because because I'm I'm just uh, I'm very curious about this. Uh, you are uh, you're an introvert and you're very open about this. And, and I'm curious, when did you first realize that you were an introvert? You know, when did that become clear to you? You know, I don't think I realized until like my mid twenties. Like, I don't think I, if you like, diagnosed myself. I think introversion extroversion is one of those things that you have to be a lot more self-aware to recognize. And it came into my awareness when I, that I was actually introverted in, in my twenties. What I noticed was the whole idea of speaking in front of people terrified me. The whole idea of selling terrified me, but I don't phys- I didn't physically label it as that. And which was a shame because otherwise there was a huge smorgasbord of advice and assistance that's out there in the world that could have helped me. What I knew is I just really struggled with sales. I really struggled with speaking. And as soon as I could label it and go, that's what it is, all of a sudden everything changed because I could all of a sudden look at the things that I developed or the skill sets that I'd learned and go on, oh, it makes sense why some of that worked now and started to become a lot more self-aware and diagnose other factors that were also because of my introversion. But I I think it's really quite difficult for a lot of people to self-diagnose because there's so many studies out there these days that overcomplicate the definition of introversion and extroversion, which makes it even harder to work out what you are. So true. And and then you have all these memes on Facebook and all these articles that say, you know, that's not what an introvert is. And it just muddies the waters even further, I feel. Um, So it just gets really, really confusing. Now, you mentioned the word selling, and and I want to address that head on because 
I found that that word selling often makes my listeners very anxious and mostly because they associate this word with certain things. And, and I'm curious when you talk about selling specifically for a service, uh, based, uh, business or individual, how do, how do you define that word? So when I talk about selling, I mean, and let's go back to the actual definition of the word, because sales originally was derived from the phrase, it's a Scandinavian term, which was to serve. Now, for me, if I look at selling through that lens, then I'm completely fine with it, because I'm absolutely happy to serve people, help them, educate them, inspire them to take action that's going to benefit them and be their consultant, be their advisor. I'm not okay to be a salesperson. As a matter of fact, I actually suck quite badly at selling. I hate closing. I'm uncomfortable with what you would consider the bulldog sales techniques or with, you know, without, you know, painting everybody with the same brush, you know, what most people would call the used car salesperson approach to closing a deal. Yeah. And I think that's what many of us tend to associate selling with, right? At least before we start learning a little bit more about it. Um, now, you found yourself in a very challenging situation a few years ago, shortly after graduating from high school. It's a fascinating story. And you had to quickly learn how to sell effectively and how to have, you know, using your words, conversations. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of people, and this is why I'm so passionate about this topic. Now, one of the things a lot of people, when they hear me speak, they're like, there's no way you're introverted. I mean, you you can talk emotively, you, you're you quite expressive on stage, you, you're a natural salesperson, but people look at me at where I am now and they imagine that that was where I started. And that's why a lot of the presentations that I do, I'm like, I would have quite happily been a quiet data entry person. Now, I would never swap my life now for that life. But if I hadn't known I had a choice and I didn't know, I fell into it, I wouldn't have taken the actions that got me where I am today. And what it was, was, I mean, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. I, because of that and some really bad acne, I was really quite self, you know, self-confident. And I, because of that, you know, I really, because of the reading speed issues, I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. And I got diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome when I was about 16, thanks to my mother just stopping at nothing to find a solution. And basically what that means is I put on a pair of glasses and then all of a sudden I can see the words on a page just like everyone else can and I can learn to read. Problem was I got to start again at the age of 16. So I was miles behind. So I worked really, really hard for that two year period. And I got into the top 20% of my state at that time. But gosh, it was difficult. I was exhausted. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. The acne didn't disappear. And people made fun of me because of these glasses that I had that had different colors on them. So all of this really derived to, well, put me in a situation where I was like, you know, I I'm, I don't really want to even talk to my own friends or be the center of attention, let alone speak to anyone. So I convinced my parents that I was going to take a year off to find myself. And I took a job at a real estate agency and, you know, I, I didn't come from a rich family. So I, I convinced my family that I would support myself. And when I, when I say real estate agency, most people think I'm the person out the front selling. I was the guy in the back office doing the data entry with a look on my sa- face saying, don't talk to me here to find myself. <laughs> and about three weeks into that job, my employer came up to me and he goes, Matt, I've, I'm sorry, I've, I've got some really bad news for you. I mean, we've just the, got notification that head office has decided to close down this office. You're out of a job. I'd worked there three weeks. So here I am just before Christmas, no experience at all in anything with this is my, my job to get through the year. And now I'm out of a job. And Australia is kind of different to the United States in, in, well, in a lot of ways. But the biggest one that was a problem for me at that time is that Christmas is our summer break and Christmas break all at the same time. So people go on holidays on the 20th of December and they don't come back to the 15th or 20th of January. So if you're an employee, you're just not hiring just before that. You're worried about getting everything finished to go on holidays. So I couldn't get a job anywhere except for these jobs that I was finding in the classifieds and they were all listed under commission only sales. Now for me, that was terrifying. Not exactly what I wanted to do. The only thing more terrifying than that was to go back to my family and tell them I'm not going to be able to pay for myself for the year because I'd made a promise. So I took a job in commission only sales. Luckily enough, I was the only one that went to an interview wearing a suit and they gave me a job in business to business sales which basically meant instead of walking door-to-door residentially, I got to walk door-to-door business-to-business. 
And after five days worth of product training and not a single second of sales training, I get thrown on this road called Sydney Road. And if you can imagine a street of, of retail stores that just goes on for as far as you can see, it's over a thousand doors on each side. And I just got told to go and sell. So I go to the first door, about to open and have this realization, no one's actually taught me how to sell. All I got was product training. I didn't know what to say. But I took a deep breath and I walked in and very shortly after I was politely told to leave. And then in the next door, I was a little bit less politely told to leave. Then I was sworn at, and then I got told to go and get a real job, which was my personal favorite. I mean, that was the only job I could get. And door after door, this happened until I made my my first sale at 93rd door. I mean, I, I remember I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds. <laughs> and then I, I had this realization, I've got to do this again tomorrow and the next day and the next. And that just, that wasn't okay. So I had to find a solution. And the, the solution that came to me is firstly, I had to realize that sales had to be a system because if it was this natural gift of gab process, my year was going to be hell on earth. So I wasn't willing for that to be the case. So I went looking for a system. And of course, I could have picked up like a Brian Tracy or a Zig Ziglar book, but I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. So it would have taken me a year to read that, let alone apply it. But what I did do is I did discover this thing called YouTube, which was just coming out at the day. And while everyone thought it was just predominantly cat videos, I discovered all of these great pieces of content from some amazing sales trainers. And I started to learn the process of the system. Well, day after day, I'd go and spend eight hours out in the field, and then I'd spend eight hours at home learning the next step in the process. Now, that was a really horrible time. I mean, I don't know any business owner that says their business is important to them, that spends that much concerted time learning the art of selling because we don't want to be in sales. But day after day, I did that for about six weeks. And then I got pulled into the office and I thought I'd done something wrong. Everybody had a, a puzzled look on their face. And my manager, which happened to be the state manager at that time, looks at me with his puzzled face and says, Matt, kind of blown away by this, but you're the number one salesperson in the company, which just so happened to be the number one sales company in the in the Southern Hemisphere. So to put that in perspective, I went from terrified to sell to the number one in the company within a period of six weeks. And I've benefited from that for the rest of my life. That is quite amazing. And this is just from trial and error, right? So you'd go go back home, learn the next step in the process. And did you were you documenting this? I mean, how did you how did you put all this together? Here's one of the key differences with how we learn sales compared to other things. If I mean, we've got, a, we've got a lot of writers online. So a lot of writers like to learn the art of writing. So because of that, they're going to go away and they're going to look at the right way to write a book, the right way to write a blog post. And we understand the system and then we apply the system to what we do. And some people are naturally talented in certain elements and have deficiencies in other elements. But we work on the deficiencies and then we become good at the whole thing. In selling, what most people do is just go out and say whatever comes out of their mouth, and then the next day they do the same thing, and then they, they don't go out of their way to get in front of customers. So because of that, when a customer comes to them, they don't have a plan, and they make a bunch of mistakes. They don't learn from them because they think it's a natural process. So what I did is the first thing that I did is I said, sales has to be a system. So let's work out what steps are in the system. So I started watching all these videos around what the sales system was. What are the stepping stone processes of a sales system? Then what I did is I said, okay, now I know what the system is. And clearly I suck at every one of those steps. <laughs> what I need to do now is focus on each one of the steps and get gradually better. Because, you know, I didn't go from 93 doors to, you know, selling every door. I went, what happened was I went, okay, the first thing I really, really sucked at is I'd start having these conversations with people. And then 30 minutes later, after finally convincing them to listen to me, they'd be like, oh, I'm not the owner though. You're like, Here's a card. You'll have to talk to them, right? So you've got to realize that sometimes you're not speaking to the right person and what conversation you need to have. But gradually, I realized that sales was a series of steps. Each one of them can be learned and mastered, but each one requires time. Just like if you're learning you know, mathematics, you know, you start with plus and minus, then you you go up to multiplication and, and then you go into, you know, algebra and you start to graduate to different elements. In sales, you've got to realize that it's a series of steps and then focus on every one of the steps. And, you know, I'd go from 
93 doors to 78 because I wasn't speaking to the wrong people as much. Then I'd go to 48 because all of a sudden they were starting to ask the right questions. And then I learned the power of story. Next thing I knew, I was in around the 23 to 24 doors. And then I started to learn how to do what's called a trial close because I never ever wanted to ask the customer for their business. So I kind of shied away from that all the time. And because of that, you know, eventually they're like, sorry, I've got a meeting. You have to leave. So because of that, I just kept talking. And I, as soon as I learned that, all of a sudden it was in the, you know, the teens. And then I realized that if I never actually asked for a sale, but instead assumed that they were going forward and came up with a structured process, I mean, word for word, I would say the same thing every time. I got down to about one in three, one in four doors between sales, which, you know, was beyond industry averages. But it's because I had a natural advantage and that was I sucked at selling. So because of that, I followed the system to the letter. I held on to it for dear life. Now, extroverts benefit from this system as well, but they love the fact that they can go off their natural personality and charisma. And because of that, they don't have a process. So I might be a better car builder than everybody else, but at the end of the day, the defect ratio is always going to be higher with me than off a production line that's systematic. Now, you, you often talk about, and that's brilliant, by the way. I, I love that. You, you often talk about the fact that introverts have an edge in sales many times. And, and I'm curious, is it because of what you just said? Are there other elements that give them an edge over extroverts? Because I think if I were an introvert right now listening to this, go, well, wait a minute. You're saying that I, I actually have a potential advantage here. That that's You got my attention. <laughs> well, absolutely. And here's why extroverts have the ability to go out and naturally strike up a conversation. For me, I have to contrive how I'm going to do that before I go to a networking event or before I go and have a phone call with a client, right? So a lot of this stuff sounds dynamic, but I mean, you sent me the questions in advance. I had to think about what I was going to respond. I'm an introvert. I like to go in with a plan. Now, as an introvert, if we have a plan and we're not in it, stuck in our heads trying to work out what to say, I mean, if I go to a speaking event and I'm going to speak, there's all these extroverts around there and they start to strike up a conversation and every now and then, and I'm getting better at it, every now and then somebody says something and it's like a joke and I just don't get it and I don't think quick enough and then I say something stupid. So because of that, I've learned that I need to prepare and prepare and prepare. But once you've prepared everything, then all of a sudden you've got this systematic process and a systematic process will always deliver more. So that's the first element. I mean, I went and spoke at an event in Thailand, came back and did eight sales calls and I literally was jet lagged like crazy. I forgot I was in my 30s, not my 20s anymore and I can't do that sort of stuff anymore. And because of that, now an extrovert, based their ability to sell based on their mood would have had a horrible sales day. For me, my ability to sell, my closure rate was almost bang on target because for me, it doesn't matter if I'm happy or sad or what's going on in my life, I just deliver the same process. Now, the second part of that is what gives us our true advantage. This is what, you know, the first step is once we've got the system, if an introvert or an extrovert was to take up a system, both of them would succeed. I mean, Brian Tracy talks about this. You know, he's been talking about it for generations. You know, the top 10% of all sales performers have a planned presentation. The bottom 80% just say whatever comes out of their mouth. And for everyone that's listening, I mean, in truth, think about what you're saying. It just whatever comes out of your mouth at the time, right? So that's got to stop. The next thing is that once you embrace that, you've got to realize an introvert has a huge amount of natural gifts that extroverts really struggle to compete with. I mean, we're so empathetic, right? We're really great listeners. And because of that, we, we ask great questions, we listen to understand, and then we can empathize with their situation and the customer can see we're feeling their problem. Extroverts really struggle to compete with that. Now, of course, extroverts can go out and learn things like active listening, asking great questions, learning emotional intelligence, but an introvert has those as gifts. So because of that, once we learn this sales system, we can then tap into our natural abilities that make it really, really quite difficult for extroverts to compete. You know, you just hit on something that I think is so important. Um, this is something when I talk to a lot of introverts, uh, they're, they're actually surprised to hear it, which is the this idea that they're better listeners. Uh, to, generally speaking, they can show greater empathy. And I, I think there's something to this idea of they create a pattern interrupt in a way, right? Because the the buyer or the prospect is not quite expecting that. And it's kind of a welcome 
relief. It's like, oh, I'm not dealing with this smooth talking extrovert. They may not think about this consciously, but it's a it's a totally different dynamic that that I think uh, lowers their their guards in a way. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing that most people listening have to understand is that's a double edged sword because if you don't have a system, your sales conversation feels like a roller coaster. You don't know which way you're going next, and it can deviate in so many different ways. And by the end, the customer's like, "All right, I get it. You can help me in a lot of different ways, but now I'm overwhelmed." And you've kind of, I really feel your empathy. So I feel like I've got a lot more chance of negotiating on price with you. Next thing I know, I'm working for dollars, cents in the dollar. And how did that happen? Now, if you have all of those advantages, but you've got a systematic process and it's a contrived one where you've thought out what you're going to do, then all of those things are an absolute advantage because they all of a sudden, the customer's like, this person gets me. I feel they understand me probably better than I understand myself. How are they doing this? And it's that ability that gives you an advantage beyond what you know any other salesperson can have. So I, I know that there's a lot of depth to any kind of, of powerful system, especially the ones you teach. But I'm curious, can you give us kind of a high-level overview of what this process might look like, just so we can start kind of visualizing uh, you know, what you might need to go through to be much more effective in a sales conversation? Yeah, absolutely. And I think before we address that, a lot of people, when I talk about, you know, having a contrived conversation or planning out what you're going to say, the first thing that people tend to hit as a hurdle is they're like, oh, no, 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 I, I need to, you know, everything I want to, I want to be authentic. I, you know, I want people to understand that, you know, I, I'm being authentic with them. I don't want to sound robotic. And everyone knows, I mean, there's not a person listening today that wouldn't have heard, had a telemarketer call them that sounds robotic while they're having their dinner and they're like, oh, my God, and they just hang up. And we don't ever want to be like that. However, what you've got to understand is they're reading off a script. The question I always ask people when I'm working with them one-on-one -on -one is, what's your favorite movie? Well, great. Who was your favorite actor in that movie? And they'll say, oh, you know, you know, I was just watching Gangs of New York. You know, Leonardo DiCaprio is amazing in that. He just embodies that character. I'm like, great. You know he's reading from a script, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. He is. And I'm like, well, tell me what the difference is between – the two two characters. Well, the person reading off the script in the telemarketing center is literally reading off the script. Leonardo DiCaprio has grabbed that script. He's written, you know, he hasn't written it out. Somebody else has written it out for him, which is even worse. Like a lot of the people listening, if they create a step-by-step -step process of what they're going to say, at least it's them and, and naturally and authentically them. And it should be, by the way, don't steal other people's words. It's got to be authentically you. I mean, for me, especially for introverts, they can feel incongruent if they're trying to grab other people's stories and, and making them own or the other people's tactics. It's got to be authentic with you as long as you follow a step-by-step -step process. But what Leonardo DiCaprio does, and any actor, and I'm not an actor, but I'm assuming here is they'll read the script over and over and over, and then they'll practice it, and then they'll imagine being that person, and they'll embody that character. And then when they tell you, you know, these lines, they're delivered like it's them. And it comes across as authentic. And the number of people that I've worked with that are worried, terrified of coming across as robotic or inauthentic, and what they've found is it actually allows them to be more authentic and more genuine because instead of feeling stuck in their head, worried about what to say next, they know exactly what they're going to say. And because of that, they can be more present in the conversation and actually spend more time being aware of what's going on with the customer and listening for the little things and the subtleties of what they say. So it's a huge advantage. But the basic process, if you like, is really around understanding first that you do have to create rapport. I mean, you've got to develop a relationship with people. Now, there are a couple of ways of doing that. For me, though, I can't just walk into a room and go, oh, he's got a, uh, a picture frame of some football team up on the wall. Now let's say something dynamic about that. I can't do that. That's just not me. Now, when I do face-to-face -face conversations, a lot of people will also offer me coffee, right? So what I will tend to do is, you know, I'll either accept or I'll say something that I've planned before, like, oh, that'd be my third coffee for the day. No, I'd be bouncing off the walls. Now they're laughing. I've built rapport with something completely contrived. When I wanted to move to Mate tea, which is, you know, a whole different, uh, a whole different thing, I started to say things like, oh, no, coffee was, you know, throwing me off the walls. And because of that, I moved to Mate tea. And then we'd have this whole conversation around how, pe how they could never give up coffee. If I, you know, there's so many different things you can do around that concept, but you've got to plan out what you're going to say. 
So it's all around building up that rapport with a client and then building trust and credibility. So, you know, you can say certain things to really help them understand that you are credible and who you've worked with in the past and help them understand who you are. And then this is the most important thing, set an agenda, right? If you don't tell them the process that you're going to follow, I mean, everybody can think back in class it's at high school or university and you see a teacher and they're kind of waning on and you're like, what are they, what are they trying to get at? What's the purpose of this lesson? I mean, I've been to seminars like that and I'm like, where are you going with this? And all of a sudden time ticks so slow. So for me, what I always suggest is set an agenda and it might be as simple as, okay, so what I'm going to have to do now is to ask you a couple of quick questions so I can get a better context on exactly what you're looking for. And then I'll be able to go into depth about what it is that I, what we can do, what it is I can do for you. And then we can get into talking about what, you know, what that's going to cost. But before I can do that, I've got to better understand your needs. Is that okay? And then they're going to say, yes. I mean, who's going to say, no, no, I really want you to sell me something that doesn't tap into my needs. I don't want you to ask me questions. But what you'll find is if you don't at least say that, what will happen is you start asking questions and they're like, no, no, but how much does this cost? Because they're not knowing how long this is going to take. They want it. And because of that, they don't know price is going to come up. And it's the most important thing to them sometimes. And you haven't built credibility. Sorry, you haven't built the amount of credibility and value that you need to yet for them to want to buy off you. So because of that, they're just like, what does it cost? I just need to know because they're still seeing you as a commodity. Once you've set that agenda, you then want to ask great questions. And this is huge for people. I mean, a lot of times I get asked, what is a great question? How do I ask great questions? You know, how do I do that on the spot? You shouldn't do it on the spot. You should plan what questions you're going to ask well in advance and have them there. I mean, I used to make my salespeople have this on a form so I could guarantee they asked the same questions every time so I could guarantee what objections they'd get and what stories they would lead to. Which brings me to the next thing. If you're asking great questions and the questions are contrived, that generally leads, especially if you focus on a market niche the same specific outcomes that they're looking for, which means you can have a couple of pre-created stories that allow people to not only feel educated and uh, around the process of writing a blog or, or writing a book, but also inspired to want to take that action, but also embedding your credibility and helping people see you as the only logical choice. Now, story is the biggest factor here, right? There's a couple of reasons for this. I mean, you know, there's studies out of Princeton that suggest that people remember 22 times more information when embedded into a story. So because of that, if I'm going up against 10 other salespeople or 10 other writers, I know they're going to remember more of what I say if I tell them a story as opposed to all of the other people that just told them features and benefits. So it's super powerful. The second thing is it allows us, and this is a study out of Stanford, when I tell people a story, it creates a natural rapport because what happens is our brains apps, uh, start to synchronize. And because of that, it's, it's like this cr artificial rapport, which is super powerful for introverts because all of a sudden, through telling a great story, people start to go, oh, I like this person. He's like me or she's like me. And we feel like we know, like, and trust them. So stories are really, really important. And the other big factor with stories is when we tell people what we can do for them, we're talking to their logical mind, which is going, I think that'll work for me. I don't know if I need that. How much time is this going to take? Are we, when are we talking about price? Look, I've just got to go as opposed to the emotional mind, because the story diffuses the logical mind and speaks directly to the emotional mind. And the emotional mind says, oh, story time, and just listens. It does. It's not programmed to listen to facts in detail. It just interprets a story and works out what the moral of that story is, and that's all it listens to. And because of that, if the moral is, I've worked with someone exactly like you, we had an amazing outcome, and as a byproduct of that, here's their return on investment. They can't say, I don't believe that story exists. It's your story of this customer. And because of that, they can't disagree. And you can get better and better at telling these stories. Just like, let's be honest, a lot of people get better and better over time about telling the story about how they met, met their partner, their, their husband, their wife. I mean, over time, we start to embellish on certain things. We start to take things out that will perhaps not as exciting or motivating for people until it becomes this theatrical masterpiece where you say, I say, I say this, she says that, you know, and then we look at each other, we say this together and people are blown away by our, how we met each other's story and business stories should be no different. Once you create that story in a way that people are like, Oh my God, I want what this person has. 
then it's super easy to do what's called a trial close. Now, a trial close is asking a question that could be perceived as asking the client to move forward, but isn't. For instance, when I used to sell education, I used to say something like, you know, so um, at this stage, I can do one of two things. Uh, sorry, I, I, would, I would ask a question, which would be something innocuous, like, so would a day clock course or a night course work better for you? And they'd be, oh, you know, a day or a night. Now, sometimes they go, oh, 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 I'm not ready to make a decision yet. And I'd say, oh, no, no, I wasn't asking you to. I just need to know the answer to that question so I can give you more detail about the specific program. Now, my trial close would be something like, and this is something that I think will work a lot better for a lot of the ghostwriters out there. Now, at this stage, I can talk to you about some great free content that I've created to help you write your blog post or your book yourself. I can talk to you about an online program that I've created to help you do that, or I can talk to you about what one, working with me one-on-one -on -one looks like. Do you have a preference? What we've just done is we've self-qualified. If they ask for the free content, you can and go into detail embellishing, explaining that because you're building a walking testimonial and a person that's going to go around telling everybody, I wish I could afford to work with them. And what you'll find is a lot of people at the end of that, you've built so much law of reciprocity, they're then going to ask about your online program or working with you. If they ask about any of the others, you then tell them about that. And then you simply move into what I call an assumptive close. Now, an assumptive close is saying something like, now, just to double check that you qualify for this, I just need to double check. Do you have an EIN number? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, I do. You say, oh, great. Would you like to grab that for me? Now, if you're face to face, then if you should have all your paperwork out and then you're filling it out so when they come back they're like oh we're doing this are we in their head they've already made the decision by getting up and getting the ein number so that's what's called an assumptive close if i do a trial close and i ask them myself which you know do you want free academy or working with me one-on-one -on -one, and they talk about the one-on-one -on -one, once i've explained that i will simply say something like so does that sound like something that would work for you? And then they'll say, yes, notice they haven't said they want to do it. That might be saying, yes, I think it works for me. I'm going to go away and consider it. And then I say, great. So what I need to do now is just work out what dates will work for me because I'm kind of booked out two and a half months in advance. Let me just check my schedule. Would this day work? Notice I'm just straight into the scheduling. Once I've done that, then I will then move across to uh, to, to then asking for a deposit and moving into payment. Now, you'll notice one of the things that I didn't talk about was price. So where does that come in? And most people think it comes as soon as the customer asks the question. Actually, it doesn't. You should never mention price until you've got the questions asked. You've told great stories. You've done a trial close to make sure that they're interested. And then as you're explaining the details of the package, that's when you get into pricing and the payment arrangements before and you do that at the very end of explaining all of it so they understand the true value not the features not the benefits but the true value for them then you'll mention price before saying now is that something that will work for you uh, you know would that work for you okay let's get you scheduled gotcha so so question about that that final piece on price so many uh, of of my listeners are in a situation where every project is kind of made to order. So every project is not a package service. It just depends on a number of variables. So you can ask a lot of questions. What I'm hearing you say is, look, get as much of the information as possible so you can get to as close to, to a, a, an actual uh, number, accurate number as possible. Uh, however, many times you just don't have all the details and it's easier, at least a temptation, is just to kind of like go back and think about it and then and then send something, send a quote, a proposal or whatever. What do you recommend in situations like that where it's not like I got three packages, it's either A, B or C, I know exactly which one they need? Yeah, definitely. So first thing is a lot of people decide that without it actually being true. So the first question I always ask people is when did you decide that it's too complicated to have packages? And we'll cover that one in a second. The second part of the question is what do you do if that's actually the case? So if it actually is the case, what you need to do is you say, you know, when you go through, you tell great stories and then you do a trial close to make sure that they're really interested. Because, gosh, I see so many people write these in-depth proposals for people that actually weren't interested. They just didn't feel great about saying, sorry, I'm going to go with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I go through a trial close and then I'll explain some ideas of what I think will work for them and then say, would that be something that worked for you? Great. I'll go away and work out a package and I'll send that through to you. But I like to make sure that I always explain in detail what that looks like. So what I would suggest is 
that let's set up a time to have another conversation so that you can ask any questions that you have and so I can explain any of the eccentricities of your specific unique business to make sure that we're all on the right track. So what I would suggest is let's set up a time. Now, I'm looking at my schedule right now and I'm free and this is what's called a double bind. I'm giving them two options. I'm free next Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock or next Thursday at three. Which one of those times would work best for you? Now, what I've just done, and you know, this is a, a neuro-linguistic programming technique uh, that said, you know, it basically highlights that if you give them one option, like, do you want to schedule a call from a, for a week's time? Their options are, yes, I do, or no, I don't. If you give them two options, then their brain then says, which one of those options will work for me? And they're not thinking about, no, I don't. Yeah, it's yes, but which one? Exactly right. Now, for those people that don't love being on the phone, know this. Your clients are hiring you because they don't like writing. You're the writer. So while you feel comfortable communicating in email form, most of your clients are probably more likely to want to communicate before they make a decision. You know, I, I worked with a, a you know, uh, Derek Lewis, who's a, a close friend of both of ours, and one of the biggest hurdles, I mean, he convinced himself that people couldn't afford him. And I said, well, how did you decide that? And he said to me, he goes, well, you know, they send me these emails asking they're interested in working. Emails will go up and back and up and back and up and back. And then they'll ask the question. We all know the question, right? How much does it cost? And then I respond and then I never hear back from them. And I says, what did you do? He's like, well, I put my price on my website. And I'm like, well, how did that go? Well, now no one contacts me, right? But in fairness, he's like, well, I'm fed up of all these people wasting my time. And I said, well, Derek, you're a ghostwriter, right? You probably don't like communicating on email, uh, uh, sorry, over the phone, but your customers don't like writing. You have to communicate with your clients in a forum that they feel comfortable with. And because of that, you know, I said when somebody you know, emails them that they're, or emails him that they're interested in the possibility of writing a book, he, they should respond with exactly this. You know, let's call the customer John. John, thank you so much for reaching out. I just looked out at your website and I'm ecstatic about some of the things that you're doing and excited about the prospect of working with you. As a matter of fact, I just finished working with someone very similar to you and, um, and, and we had a great working relationship. But being somebody's ghostwriter really does come down to relationship. So I really want to make sure that you and I are a great fit. Plus, I've got some questions to ask you before I can give you a specific price. So I'd love to get on a call. Below is a link to my scheduling app. Simply book a call, and that way we can have a chance to, to get to know each other, and at the end I'll be able to give you a formalized price. Simply click on the link below, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. As soon as he started doing that and some elements of the sales process, all of a sudden not only could people afford him, they started paying him double because we put his prices back up because he thought it was the fact that people couldn't afford him, and he made more money in – you know, six weeks than he'd made in the two years beforehand, right? So making sure that you communicate in the right, the, the, the right forum is absolutely important. And while it may make sense for you to go away and think about it, generally that happens for a couple of reasons. So this was a big defining moment for Derek as well. So Derek used to go around and everybody had their specific requirements. Do they need a proposal? Do they need this? Do they need that? And I said, Derek, you don't really have you know, a lot of, you know, things that are that are different. So what I would suggest you do is you have, would you like to work with me to help you get everything you need together to make sure you've got the right framing, the right narrative, and I'll coach you to write your book yourself. Second, would you like me to write the book for you? And thirdly, would you like me to write the book? Would you like me to work out what the book is, write the book with you, and do a book proposal? And we created three specific packages. All of a sudden, this gave him a superpower because he would talk about the package that interested them. And when they said, no, no, I want it to be cheaper, he would navigate to the lower priced package. And they're like, no, no, but I want that package. And it, was, it became a question of, which one of these packages can you afford, not can you come down on price? And that's a massive difference. Now, for a lot of those people out there that are writing blog posts, what I try to do is insert what's called a consulting engagement first. See, most people will come to you and say, I need blog copy, but they haven't really thought through their blog copy that they need. And for you to retain a client for a long period of time, we all know the copy has to have an ROI to it, or you're going to lose the client eventually going, I'm just not getting results. So what I always suggest is what can you create 
that is a short-term quick win strategy session, series of sessions, and then have a subscription after that of monthly recurring writing services. And that way you can structure it. But in truth, a lot of times you'll find, and this is one of the biggest things that I always try and tell people, is the hardest thing about packaging generally stems from a problem in marketing, which is that you're trying to work with anybody that will hire you. And I totally get it. I mean, when you're struggling to make money, working with anybody is the right solution. But in truth, why do you want to compete against people that are in more that are more experienced with you um, than you, might have more economies of scale, or might be working in a foreign country where their living expenses are less high, and put yourself in a situation where all you have to uh, to compete on is price and the hope that they'll see your ability far outweighs those other people, which it probably does. But at the initial stages, they're not seeing that. So by focusing in at a, on a niche market and saying I work exclusively with this demographic, that doesn't exclude everybody else. Because those people are hearing the same broad, broad message because to specialize, I mean, we see a doctor that's got a speciality, they learned all of medicine before they specialized. So a specialist must be better at everything and then they specialized in this. So the psychology is they're amazing, but they work exclusive, you know, they, work, they specialize in this group. Think of the power that gives you, though, to the group that is in that marketplace. That marketplace is like, oh, this is the only logical choice, and I know I'm paying a premium, but they understand my market, so of course it's going to be an easier working process. Absolutely. Well, two things that you said that I think have been absolutely gold, and really everything you've shared is gold, but the, the fact that it, it's process trumps personality, um, just to say it you know, in one sentence, and, and I think that is so key because that then – takes away the whole excuse of I'm not this person or I don't have this personality or it doesn't matter. Process trumps everything. And then uh, I would say three. The, the second one and something I preach a lot is when you focus on a specific target market, you're able to create and execute a process uh, that, that's just eventually flawless. I mean, you're able to really execute this very, very well because there's only so many scenarios and then you have these stories that you could leverage. So I think it's absolutely brilliant. And, and then this, this, this final one, I, I think, Matthew, the brilliance of this final one is that, you know, um, why not simplify it and just charge enough that no matter what the particulars of the project are, you're going to, it's going to be profitable and it's going to be fun, right? So in other words, have narrowed down to a few packages, a, a few price points and, and just make them high enough that you're going to make money. And then it's either kind of take it or leave it. I don't mean in that, hey, you're not going to show the value, but in terms of, hey, I, I got these options, which ones do you want? And it's not, you you can't customize your option, right? It's if you want something lower, then we got to move down to option B instead of option A. And I think it's absolutely brilliant because you're right. There are plenty of clients out there and it's not about, you're not a retail store, right? You're not trying to get every customer that walks in front of your store or by your store. You're trying to make sure you you bring in the right clients, and that that is absolutely key and such a huge lesson. Absolutely, I mean there are a couple of elements there. I mean when you go to a fancy restaurant, they tend to have less on the menu than the cheesecake factory, yet everything's more expensive because they're really good at that. So when you say I can do everything, then they're seeing you like the cheesecake factory, not the fancy restaurant. Secondly, the stories that you need, you need hundreds of stories to speak to all these different industries. For me, because I focus on one specific niche group, I really only have three stories and I just get better and better at telling them. So the sales process becomes easier. The packaging becomes so much simpler. And yes, I mean, a lot of problems that writers have is they undersell their, their ability. And because of that, they underprice themselves because they say, oh, you know, I could never charge that. And that gets in their way. And then when somebody, you know, says, you know, you can't have a standard price because, you know, if I've got to write 35,000 words for a book or 75,000, clearly that's going to cost more. Well, no, sometimes it's harder to write less than more. But if you charge enough that either way you're happy, then you're going to have a great outcome. So if you charge enough, it makes absolute total sense. But yeah, it really does come down to work out what your message is that separates you, work out what marketplace you want to work in, then create packaging and pricing that makes sense then create the sales system that incorporates great stories. Most people don't do any of that, which is why they say it's really hard to get a customer to buy and they don't enjoy it. I mean, Derek hated sales. Now he actually really quite enjoys the process. 
Absolutely. And, and that mentality, that scarcity thinking comes from the fact that you, the, this belief that, well, there's not enough of them out there. So I got to take whatever I can get. When in reality, there's so much abundance out there that you really should. I mean, if you're going to have fun as a self-employed professional, might as well work with the clients who are going to make things fun and, and going to give you joy. So, man, solid, solid advice, my friend. I, as we wrap up, I, I want to make sure that you tell us a bit about your book, which is excellent, and where listeners can learn more about you, Matthew. Absolutely, and thanks, Ed. I The best place to find stuff from me is obviously matthewpollard.com, but I set, share so many videos on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, so feel free to join those. I mean, YouTube gave me so much when I was grow, you know, learning to sell, so I now provide heaps of free videos out on those platforms. But for people that are listening that sales kind of terrifies you, my publisher hates this uh, when I say this, but in truth, you don't need to buy my book. You can go to the introvertsedge.com and download the first chapter absolutely for free. Now, if you do that, it will outline a clear seven step process in there. You know, I didn't fill it full of fluff to sell the rest of the book. I outlined the full process. I mean, my mission is to absolutely help introverts believe that this is possible for them. And I mean, that's why I bought National Introverts Week to really help bring this stigma, you know, this really confront this stigma. But if you you do nothing more than map this seven step process down, work, look at what you're currently saying and try and fit it into that. And what you'll realize is there's some elements that don't fit. Well, they don't fit because you shouldn't be saying it to clients. So throw that out. Then you'll realize there's a bunch of gaps there. Fill those gaps in. You'll find that's probably a lot of questioning and a lot of the sale, uh, the the ability of selling through story. And you fill those gaps. If you do nothing more than that, you'll double your sales in the next sixty days. And I asked Derek if I was allowed to say this because Derek w- was the person that worked with me on this book because he was a big advocate of my work after how I helped him. And what was really interesting is in chapter ten of my book, uh, there's a reason why Derek's name's on the cover. And what happened was. There was this process with everything changed. So he went from struggling to make $27,000 in one year, and then he made $12,000 by October the the next year. And then he reached out to me, and two weeks later, he'd made $40,000. Six weeks, he'd made eighty. dollars By the end of the year, he'd made one hundred and twenty. dollars And then it just kept going up, and then all of a sudden, it got harder. And he said, Matt, the market's changed. And I'm like, what do you mean the market's changed? And he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing exactly what you told me to do in the past, and people aren't buying anymore. People are going away. They're, they're not coming back to me and buying. And I said, well, you're doing everything exactly the same way. And he said, well, not exactly. And I said, well, how much have you changed? He changed everything, <laughs> right? He'd, he'd changed stories. He'd embellished on things, but he changed more than one thing at a time. I mean, selling is one of those things. You should treat it like an experiment, which is great for us introverts because it's external. We analyze it externally rather than taking it as an emotional thing on our on ourself. But here's the really interesting thing. If you change more than one thing, just like a scientist, if your experiment blows up, you don't know what factor made it blow up. So you can only change one thing at a time. And he'd got overconfident and things had changed. As soon as he went back to the process, all of a sudden he made 100 grand in like two months. And he went, he got a client that took him to Switzerland, a client that went to London. So be careful what you tell yourself. For Derek, he told himself the market had changed when actually he just moved away from the process. But the reason why he's in the book is he shares that story in chapter 10. And what's really great for a lot of ghostwriters out there is in chapter 10 of The Introvert's Edge, he actually outlines his entire sales script, word for word, what he says to a client from when they book a phone call, everything he says to get clients to buy. So while normally I say to people, look, you don't have to buy the book, just focus on chapter one. In chapter 10, if you don't know what to say to customers, if you don't know what questions to ask, he literally outlines every single step in his entire sales process. Yeah, that alone is worth the price of the book. I, I've seen his his uh, his script and what he, what he says, and it's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, so, Matthew, thanks again for coming on the the show. This is I, there's just so much value here. Um, I'm still trying to process <laughs> everything you've shared with us. Mate, you're very welcome. I was honored to be on. Thank you for having me. The High Income Business Writing Podcast is a production of B2B Business Launcher. Learn more at b2blauncher.com.